Hey guys. This is part 4 of what if Narugo was a blacksmith apprentice. Shikamaru leaves the village for a mission near Iwagakure when he meets a talented blacksmith apprentice called Naruto. He could swear that he's met the guy before but none of his friends seem to remember him. Feeling that something's amiss, Shikamaru tries to find out who Naruto is and why he seems so familiar. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 8 Hinata's eyes were trained on the flames burning in the center of the loose circle they were sitting in. Shikamura had told them to use the time to sleep because they wouldn't be getting another opportunity to rest soon. But no matter how hard she tried to ease herself into unconsciousness, it didn't work. It was frustrating because she could feel just how tired she was. After all, they had been running the whole day long. But she was too anxious to relax. The constant reminder that she couldn't allow herself to fail this time wouldn't leave her alone. This was an important mission, a project that's been going on for ten years. Even if the Hokage hadn't told them of its significance, she could have guessed it by all the people who were involved in it. Karinai-sensei, Gai, Asuma, Genma and Kakashi were all jonin. Who knew what the other part of their team consisted of? Shino, she called, her voice low. H.M.? Who do you think is on the other group? Although the majority of her teammates' expressions was hidden behind his clothes and sunglasses, Hinata knew that he was frowning. After spending so much time with him and Kiba, there was something almost instinctual about reading them. Since it's our objective to find and retrieve, it would make sense for them to consist of shinobi who are skilled at scouting, he replied in his monotone voice. Kiba, apparently having listened to their conversation, turned to Shikamaru who was sitting crouched over a map. Hinata could see the brooding lines spread over his forehead. He looked exhausted. Hey Shikamaru, you know who's on the other group, right? The boy didn't even bother lifting his head. Go to sleep, he grumbled. Kiba didn't press the issue, maybe because Shikamaru didn't seem to be in a mood to bicker. Hinata returned to her own musings. The target, Naruto Uzumaki had looked like he was about their age, and he had left Konoha before he even had the chance to enter academy. Although she wondered why her village was so dead set on finding him, she didn't dare to voice her thoughts. She wasn't in any place to question orders. Still, it didn't prevent her from wondering. After all, finding and retrieving was, or at least should be, her specialty and she was well versed in its theory. There were several reasons why someone would want a person to return to their village. It went further than just eliminating a possible threat. After all, they had been explicitly told not to kill the target, but to return him in a healthy condition. Most of those reasons boiled down to either being someone important or possessing something of importance. That meant that Uzumaki could be the child of someone politically influential. Or he could have some sort of object that Konoha didn't want to let go of. The last possibility the one that Hinata hoped not to apply to their situation, was that their target had abilities that their village wanted to use or at least prevent getting abused by other nations. It didn't happen very often, but every time it did, an uneasy weight settled on her chest. Hinata was glad that Niji wasn't here. After all, his own father had been sacrificed to prevent the secrets of their Byakugan from spreading. Although her cousin hated her, she wouldn't want him to experience something that had hit so close to home. Just a couple years ago, it had already happened. Sasuke Uchiha, a boy that she had graduated academy with, had left their home. For some time, Kanoha had tried to retrieve him because they hadn't wanted one of the last users of the Sharingan to leave the village. But soon, Tsunade had stopped believing that Sasuke would ever become anything else than a threat to their home maybe because the boy had run to Orochimaru, the man who'd been a great danger to Kanoha ever since he'd left it. Sasuke had been outlawed. The order was no longer retrieve, but to eliminate. A shiver ran down her spine despite being so close to the campfire. Luckily, that wasn't the case with their current target. She wouldn't be forced to kill anybody. She looked up from the fire to watch her group members lying around the flames. Everyone but her and Shikamaru seemed to have fallen asleep. The boy gathered the map that he'd spread across the grass and put it aside. Shikamaru? Surprised, he looked up. 
Hinata didn't blame him. She was surprised that she had dared to speak up, as well. But ever since Shikamaru had joined her team for a training session, she had had the opportunity to grow a little more accustomed to him. He was a little grumpy at times, but otherwise nice. What will happen to our target after we've captured him? She knew she shouldn't ask. There wasn't any use in thinking of their target as a person, someone who was, just like them, a human being. They had to stay detached. She'd been told often enough that commiserating with someone made you weak. Hinata knew all too well that she was weak. Shikamaru shrugged and lifted his head. When Hinata followed his gaze, she spotted Kakashi sitting on a branch of an old tree, distanced from their group. Don't know, the boy answered and lay himself on the ground to get as much sleep as he still could in the short remainder of the night. I just hope that they'll leave me alone when this is over. To what do we owe the pleasure? Asuma-sensei asked. The smile that spread over his face was so sweet that Shikamaru would have believed it to be real if he hadn't known any better. But as it was, he did know better. Shikamaru was in no mood to deal with the Kazakage's older sister breathing down his neck. Either was Asuma-sensei. Tamari grinned that cocky grin of hers, absolutely unapologetic and elated about being able to disturb their work. The Kazakage requests detailed information on the shinobi that will occupy the borders of our country. That we have given him, Kakashi retorted. An outsider wouldn't have been able to pick up on the irritation in his nonchalant posture and uncaring words. But Shikamaru, having spent a lot of time around him during the recent months, could make out the slight hint of irritation in his voice. Gara wants to know the exact positioning of your people, not just some vague layout, the girl countered. Shikamaru sighed. Dealing with Suna was always a tedious affair. We don't know the exact positioning yet. We'll develop it as we go along. Then I will stay with you until you do know. Shikamaru rolled his eyes. Whatever. Knock yourself out. They couldn't afford to lose any time. Until now, everything had gone according to plan. They had arrived in wind without facing any obstacles on their way. A few hours ago, he had sent the group he had traveled with to keep an eye on the eastern borders while the other group was managing the north. But there was no concrete plan, at least not until they found out more about Naruto's whereabouts. They had to get the mission going. There are four inns in close distance, he explained, recalling the maps that he'd been studying during the last week. I suggest that we split up to save time. You, he nodded towards Asuma-sensei and Kakashi, will take the ones in the west and I'll take the two in the east. We'll meet again in an hour. They nodded and ran off. When Shikamaru started to get moving, too, he was all too aware of the girl that had latched herself to his side. So what's the purpose here? She asked conversationally. What, your brother hasn't told you? She shrugged. He just wanted some quick information on your positioning. Don't think you're all that important. He stared off into distance, searching for a building in the masses of sand. Then why do you want to know? He asked absentmindedly. I'm bored, she grumbled. After all, it looks like I've gotta spend the rest of the day with you guys. We're looking for someone, he replied. She'd soon find out that much anyway. Fortunately, she was prevented from asking further questions when a building with the sign of an inn came into view. Actually, you should be grateful I came with you, she commented in that smug tone that made Shikamura hear the smirk in her voice. Yeah? Why is that? Having the Kazakage's sister at your side while roaming through the land of wind can only be of benefit. He didn't bother replying and opened the wooden door they had arrived at to enter the building. Save for the two women who were sitting at the reception and idly chatting with each other, the room was empty. Welcome, the young, freckled ginger whose name badge Red K he greeted. How can we help you? A room for two? The middle-aged woman with long, black hair suggested with a polite smile. Over my dead body, Tamari snapped before Shikamaru could answer. The receptionist laughed. Oh, I'm sorry, the dark-haired woman apologized, still not being able to suppress her giggling. But when you both entered, I just thought. Shikamaru squelched the urge to groan. He had no time for this. Actually, we're looking for someone. Finally, the women sobered up, their stares nervously slipping towards his headband. Shikamaru slouched his shoulders into a relaxed position, 
trying to seem as little threatening as possible to alleviate the tension that had suddenly emerged in the room. Some civilians couldn't help being anxious around ninjas, especially foreign ones. He slipped one hand into his breast pocket and pulled out the picture of Naruto. Do you remember this boy ever staying at your place? The older woman gave the picture a short look before shaking her head. No, but I just started working here last month. Do you know the young man, Kehi? The ginger grabbed the image and bingo. Her face lit up in recognition. Yeah, that guy's been here once. That's a couple months ago, though. What else do you remember about him? Anything could be of importance, Shikamaru pressed. Kehi shrugged. He didn't talk much. Honestly, I wouldn't have even remembered him if he hadn't looked so cute. Kehi! Her colleague exclaimed, her expression scandalized. The girl laughed. What? You know that I'm husband hunting right now and I'm all about that exotic look. She inspected the picture again. Since this place is at the border, many foreigners pass by, but I haven't seen anyone look quite like him before. Silently, Shikamura thanked all deities that the Yandame had such distinctive features that he managed to pass on to his son. Anything else that stood out to you? Ginger knitted her brows. Like I said, he didn't really talk much. I tried to flirt but he didn't seem to get it. He was polite though, gave a nice tip and left his room clean. That's all I remember other than his name. Surprised, Shikamura asked, he gave you his name? She nodded. It's protocol. We know that all the ninjas lie their asses off, but we only want them for bookkeeping purposes, anyway. What name did he give to you? His first name was Kaimen. She leaned her elbows on the counter and propped her chin up, her face dreamy. I thought it was fitting because Ocean suited his eyes so well. The last name. With a huff, she began rummaging through the cupboards under the counter. Let's see, I think that was a couple of months ago, sometime around May. She pulled out a worn notebook and quickly flipped from one page to the next. Ah, there we go. Kaiman Kodiai. Stayed one night, just like I remember. Shikamura looked at the name that her finger was pointing towards and nodded. Thank you. You were a great help. When they exited the building, Tamari raised her brows in a skeptical manner. So what now? Can you finally give me the layout? We're not nearly done. He answered dryly and began heading towards the next and that wasn't too far from here. You know that you were lucky this time, right? The girl challenged. Not every place will have a flirty receptionist to remember that one guy who happened to stay at their inn for a night. He shrugged. I know that much myself. But getting lucky once might be enough. Tamari wasn't wrong. In the next inn they visited, none of the workers recognized Naruto. Shikamaru still made sure to take their guest book with him. When they were finished up, he steered towards their meeting point where Kakashi and Asuma-sensei were already waiting for them. Any clues? His teacher asked. There was nothing at the places we interviewed. Shikamura nodded. He's been spotted at one of our places. He stayed one night and used the name Kaiman Kodiai to check in. The two men visibly perked up. So after passing the border, he moved to the east? Looks like it. We're going to continue our search in that direction. Make sure to collect the guestbooks that the inn's owners have to maintain. They dispersed and continued their search in two separate groups. When the sun was no longer at its zenith, Shikamaru and Temari fled to the shadows that a big rock offered. He was leaning against the hard, warm stone and staring at the various guestbooks that they had collected over the course of the day. During the last few hours, they hadn't hit another jackpot like they did at their first interview but they hadn't come out completely empty-handed either. One worker whom Kakashi and Asuma-sensei had questioned had recognized Naruto's face. Shikamaru spread his map out and signed the places their target had been spotted at. Until now, it seemed like he'd continuously moved towards the south, never straying too far into the west. That meant that he tried to get out through the eastern side of the country. Good, he wouldn't have wanted to run all the way towards the opposite end of the Land of Wind. Where are the other guys? Temari asked, creating a faint breeze with a little fan to cool herself off. Shikamaru wished he could find a way to alleviate the heat, too, or better yet, take a nap at some place where the sun didn't shine. He was exhausted, but he still had work to do. 
still interviewing. She groaned. When are you gonna be done? I want to return to Suna. Shikamaru didn't break his gaze from the name in the guestbook he'd spotted. Not much longer. I almost have him. What? She leaned over from where she was sitting next to him to look over his shoulder. You found something out? He shrugged and pointed towards the line in the book. A small mistake from him is all that we needed. A grin spread over her face when she read the words. Time and Cody I. He's used the same name twice. Not long after, her expressions crumpled into a frown. How'd you manage to find that so quickly? There are so many names in there. But there's only a certain time frame that we need to check. Then you take out everyone who stayed for longer than just one night, and the number you have to go through is manageable, he explained. Tamari picked up her fan that she dropped in excitement. I get it, because he's only passing through. He's bound to break that pattern, though. Exactly. When the one-night trail stops, we'll know that he's arrived. He looked up to check the position of the sun. They had enough time until it'd begin to set. The others should be here soon. Tamari squinted. You're right, she grumbled and rolled her eyes, of course. Shikamaru turned around to spot Kakashi and Asuma Sensei's fast-moving figures. Even from this distance, he could distinguish the cigarette in between his teacher's lips and wondered how the man could stand smoking in this absurd heat. But when the two men arrived at their meeting point, they painted a picture of textbook ninja stoicism, adaptable to any kind of environment. So? You found something? Tamari demanded eagerly. Kakashi nodded and turned towards Shikamaru to meet his gaze. We went through all the places you've assigned us to but he's only ever been sighted in one town that's an hour away from Suna. He crouched down and pointed at the map, his finger trained on a village north of Suna. Nothing else? Shikamaru checked. When the two men shook their heads, he picked his pen up to scribble another cross on that point and use it as the center of a circle that would roughly translate into a radius of hundred kilometers in real life. He's somewhere in this area. He couldn't have traveled any further than that if we considered that he was able to return to the smithy in a matter of only two weeks. Asuma Sensei sighed in satisfaction and cracked his neck. Finally, he sighed. That's right around the area of Suna, Tamari pointed out, her face twisted into a deep frown. Can I see the picture of that guy again? He seized into the pocket of his vest and pulled the image out only for the girl to snatch it out of his fingers. Her skin was marred by lines of innermost concentration when she murmured, I think might have seen him, I'm not sure. In Suna? He questioned. Maybe. She shrugged and reached the picture out, but when he grasped it, Temari didn't let go. Instead, she held his stare. Blondie over there isn't a danger to Suna, is he? Not that we know of, he answered, not entirely sure whether he was telling the truth. She loosened her grip and he put the image back into its original place. Tamari inspected him for a few seconds longer before she finally broke her gaze. So are we finally finished here, or what? I still have to report your exact positioning. I'm sure Gar is getting impatient. We're finished, Shikamaru confirmed and motioned Kakashi and Asuma Sensei to sit down next to them so he could explain the further steps of their plan. We're predicting that the target will try to leave the land of wind in the fastest way possible. Considering his current position, that leaves us with four possible escape routes. He quickly drew four crosses on his map and continued, those routes lead to the borders of birds, rain, rivers and to the port at the southeastern end of wind. Asuma Sensei exhaled a breath of smoke with a sigh. Not a small area. It's okay, Shikamaru reassured him because we'll focus on the port and on the border to birds. It's unlikely that he'll choose to escape through rain or rivers since they're located right next to the land of fire. But once he got to the sea or to birds, we'd have a hard time tracking him down. We will still leave some people at rain or rivers though, right? Kakashi checked. The team leader nodded. Of course. Once he arrives at birds, he may continue towards earth since he knows that we are on bad terms with IWA. The man mused. That's very likely, Asuma Sensei confirmed. And something he would totally do. Then I want to keep track of the border to birds, Kakashi demanded. All right, Shikamaru agreed. 
His plans had already relied on the fact that Kakashi would want to be in charge of an area where Naruto was most likely to pass by. Then you will meet up with the second part of the group that's waiting between birds and rain. Take Niji, Lee and Reidu with you to keep track of your area and tell the other three to watch over rain. Got it. Shikamaru turned to his teacher. We are going to return to the group that we came to wind with. Shino, Kurinai and Genma will watch over River's border while you, me, Hinata, Kiba and Guy focus on the port. When Asuma-sensei nodded in understanding, he finally turned to the only girl among them. That's our exact positioning, Tamari. Do you need anything more? She shook her head and stood up, managing to take one step before she stopped herself to turn around. After a short moment of hesitation, she seized her hand into the insides of her dress and pulled out a little scroll. Take that with you, she offered while stretching her arm out. He raised an eyebrow before accepting the object and fitting it in between his clothes. What's in it? Fireworks. I will be looking out for them tonight. Her face was wrinkled into a deep-sitting frown. I feel like I've seen that guy you're searching for, but I can't place his face. I've got a weird feeling about this. If you find him and he looks like he poses any kind of threat to Suna, light the fireworks. I'll be there. Shikamaru nodded and turned to Kakashi and Asuma-sensei. Let's get going. Shikamaru pinched the skin of his arm, forcing his eyes to stop drooping as he watched the fiery red of the desert sunset. He hadn't gotten much sleep in the last days, and when he was up, he always had to plan their next step, keep track of their plan and watch out for his team members. Still, no matter how many excuses existed, he had to stay alert. Everything they had worked towards lead to this point. He briefly turned around to check whether Asuma-sensei and Guy were still on their posts near the sea. Spotting their faces in the crowd, he turned back to train his gaze on Hinata and Kiba who were keenly analyzing the people that passed by. From a bird's eye view, they were positioned like five pips on a dice. Off the top of his head, he'd give it 35%. That's how high the probability of Naruto passing through was. Another 35 for the bird's border. If he escaped through these routes, they could pretty much kiss their chances of catching him goodbye. Maybe it was better this way. He stopped that train of thought and grabbed his walkie-talkie to get through to Kiba. Under the noise of static swooshing, the boy's familiar voice checked in. Yeah? Have you picked up on anything? No, nothing. Shikamaru sighed and wished that Kakashi was having luck. He wasn't in the mood to chase Naruto through the port in case he decided to use a ship to get out of the country. The crowd that had gathered to get on one of the last ferries would only make this more bothersome. Maybe Naruto had planned all of this. One didn't stand out too much amidst so many people. It was easy to drown out in a crowd. Waves crashed against the docks as a salty breeze passed by. Shikamaru didn't doubt Kiba's or Akamaru's ability to pick up a scent, but the constant wind and the onslaught of many different smells would make it more difficult. Again, his gaze carried over to the boy and his dog where he noticed a girl accidentally walk into Kiba, impact causing her to tumble to the ground. Amidst the confusion, the boy must have activated his walkie-talkie because Shikamaru could hear them talking through his device now. I'm so sorry, she apologized, her voice neither too high nor too deep. From the distance, Shikamaru could see her dust her short skirt off and brush the wrinkles out of her thick poncho. Kiba just kept on staring at her in a dumbfounded way. The team leader rolled his eyes. Uh, no problem, I hope you're okay. Um, you didn't hurt yourself, did you? The girl giggled and ran a hand through her shoulder-long, blonde hair. She was trying to push her fringe out of her face that kept bothering her when another sea breeze washed through the port. The whole ordeal couldn't have been going on for longer than about half a minute and Shikamaru was ready to snap at Kiba to stop his poor flirting attempts and concentrate on their task when Akamaru's loud barking beat him to it. Did that mean Dash? He perked up. Naruto was here? Before he could even attempt to move, Akamaru had jumped up, ready to tear into the strange girl's ankle before she swiftly moved aside and leaped through crowd. People started shouting in fear of the big dog that was now chasing a young woman through the masses. Realization dawned on him. Shit. Guys, it's her him whatever. That girl over there's our target. She smells like him. 
In a flash, Kiba and the rest of their group who'd witnessed the whole ordeal through their devices, as well, left their positions to search for the girl with the blonde hair. Only Shikamaru was rooted to his place. Something didn't add up and he'd never been one to ignore inconsistencies. If that had been Naruto, why had he just openly walked into a Konoha ninja, someone he'd be trying his best to avoid? And why hadn't Kiba smelled him before he'd stood right in front of him? Uneasily, he skimmed over his surroundings. Activating his walkie-talkie, he ordered everyone, return to your original positions. What? Guy exclaimed loud enough to hurt his ears. Are you sure? Asuma-sensei checked. Yes, trust me with this. Everyone come back immediately. What about this youthful girl, I mean Naruto? Let him go, Shikamaru interrupted him. I'll explain it to you later. In less than a minute, Guy and Asuma-sensei had returned to their posts while Shikamaru nervously searched the agitated crowd for the two missing members of their group. He activated his walkie-talkie, barely able to hear his own voice through the noise of the anxious people rushing by. Shikamaru? Kiba asked through the unusually loud static. He had a hard time making out the boy's words. Where are you? He demanded. And where's Hinata? She went after the target and dropped her walkie-talkie when someone ran into her. I think she didn't hear you calling us back. I'm looking for her, but all these people getting in my way are slowing me down. The team leader cursed. Is Akamaru with you? Yes. Send him back. Return as soon as you've found Hinata. Kiba ended their conversation with an all right. Where some might have lost him already, Hinata's milky eyes were still keenly trained on Naruto Uzumaki's fast-moving form, and she was sure that the girl she was following was Naruto Uzumaki. Kiba had never been wrong before. She frowned. Why hadn't Kiba noticed her him until he'd walked into him? Maybe he'd been distracted, but even Akamaru hadn't picked up on the scent until their target stood right in front of him. No, she had to figure that out later. She couldn't allow herself to mess this up again. With practice moves she hurried through the masses, her eyes never leaving her target. Whatever had made him immune to Kiba's sense of smell, it didn't apply to Hinata's eyes. The Byakugan made it easy to keep track of him. His body was like a beacon in between the people, his insides glowing brightly from all the unused chakra that was burning inside his coils. It made her nervous to watch such a magnitude of energy, ready to overflow and explode. Hinata had seen countless chakra pathways before, and this boy's body was far from normal. Confused, she squinted, trying to make out whether she was missing something. No. He wasn't even using his energy efficiently. While his chakra had vaguely collected itself at the lower half of his body, it wasn't centered around the exact points that would propel him to move faster. Distracted by her own concerns, she only realized that she'd lost focus when she stumbled over her own feet and crashed into the dry, earthy ground. A whimper escaped through her throat as she made herself stand up and look out for the person she'd been following. Relief and anxiety filled her simultaneously when her eyes spotted the brightly shining figure, in far distance, but still in reach. She almost wished that he'd escaped. Hinata didn't want to confront him. Before her doubts could fester and prevent her from moving like they so often did, she forced herself to pick up the chase. The others would probably join her soon, she only had to keep an eye on him. But Naruto Uzumaki had stamina that she couldn't keep up with. She could feel her breathing become shallow, her lungs ache. However, as if the universe for once wanted to reach its hand out to her, they eventually reached the end of land. There, in distance, was a cliff that mercilessly separated them from the sea. The running figure came to a halt when there was nowhere else to flee to. There was only water and the way that would lead back to Hinata. As she watched him turn around, her second thoughts resurfaced. That much chakra. Could she keep up with that? He'd probably beat her into the ground with breaking a sweat and again, she messed the whole mission up, such an important one, too. Her legs gradually slowed their pace until they eventually stood still. Where were the others anyway? Hesitantly, she dared to turn around, but there was no one. She had long escaped the crowd that had wanted to reach the ships at the port. Neither Kiba, nor Shikamaru, Guy or Asuma were standing behind her. Anxiously, she patted her jacket and searched for her walkie-talkie down. Her breath hitched. 
It couldn't be. She had put it in her pocket not long ago, she was sure. But looking through her clothes, she realized that she must have lost it somewhere along the way. There was no other explanation. Not knowing what else to do, she looked ahead. There stood Naruto Uzumaki gazing herself confidently in the eyes. The blonde hair was swaying in the wind and Hinata was reminded of how well he had carried himself as a woman. The way he was watching her. Was it false bravado or the self-assurance of a fighter who knew what he was capable of? Hinata didn't want to do this. She wished the earth would swallow her up and keep her inside so she could remain saved from this dubious situation. But she had to act. She feared her father's reaction if she returned home without having done everything in her power to bring this mission to success. After taking a shaky breath, she compelled her legs to make one step after another while willing her Byakugan to reactivate. His chakra was just the way it was before, just as huge, uncontrollable, and volatile. However, like before, he wasn't using it in a way that would suggest he was a ninja preparing for confrontation. His body, however, moved into a clear fighting stance that she couldn't recognize. Finally decided to come my way? He mocked. Hanada was too focused on his voice to answer his question. It wasn't overly deep, but it didn't reach the feminine high it did when speaking with Kiba. Your voice, she murmured so lowly that she was surprised he even caught it. He shrugged, a whimsical smile spreading over his face. Takes a lot of practice. Hanada shook her head, trying to disperse her distracting observations. This was ridiculous. She had to bring their target down, now. There was no time for niceties and conversation. Although she didn't know where the others were, she couldn't afford to wait for them. Clumsily, her feet pressed off the ground as she ran towards the cliff. Tension returned to his limbs as he took on defensive stance before changing his mind in the last moment to sidestep her. She willed her chakra to run through her arms and continued on attacking him, but he avoided her hits before eventually fleeing out of her immediate reach. Gritting her teeth, she followed him, trying to get one hit to land. One hit may be all she need. If she could disable one pressure point, he'd have much more difficulty fleeing from her. But it seemed like he had decided to keep her in safe distance as he continuously kept on backing off towards the edge of the cliff. She felt her breathing become more labored as she resumed on firing one hit after another, just one hit, only one hit. Hinata! Finally! Kiba! She answered, dizzy with relief to hear her teammate's familiar voice from behind her. She was unfocused for one second, a single second, but that was enough time for her to overlook that they had reached the end of the cliff. She only noticed what was going on when she was already falling. Everything happened so fast but the fall itself felt slow. It must have been her imagination because she couldn't muster up the speed to hold on to something to keep herself up. Hinata knew she would drop. Her body would be captured by merciless gravity before crashing into the harsh ocean when the fast fall came to a sudden stop. She was breathing heavily, the beating of her heart so rough that it hurt her chest. Turning her head downwards, she saw the sea's angry waves crashing against hard, sharp-edged rocks below but she was in the air unmoving. She looked up and spotted her arm that felt like a foreign limb being holed up by a sturdy hand. Try to climb up, Naruto prompted through gritted teeth, face slightly scrunched up in effort to keep on holding on to her. Why? Could you get up before I let you drop into the sea? Naruto interrupted, his mouth twisted into an irritated frown. If you keep on hanging there, I'll let go. Her breath hitched but not soon after, She recollected her thoughts and brushed her feet against the rock of the cliff to look for something to support her legs. Having found a protruding area, she tested it before leaning her weight on it and heaving herself upwards with the help of Naruto's arm. She was on her knees, trying to understand what had just happened when Kiba arrived by her side. Hinata! He called, his hands landing on her shoulder and running over her back as if to check whether she was really there. You okay? After a moment of hesitance, she nodded and met her friend's eyes. I'm fine, she answered a little breathlessly. He relaxed and turned towards Naruto who was standing at the edge of the cliff while watching her with a mildly concerned expression. Thank you, Kiba sighed, his eyes shining with honest gratitude as he stood up. You're really not that bad of a guy. 
Incredulity filled Hinata as she saw her teammate's body move into its familiar fighting stance. So don't take this too personal, Kiba said in an apologetic tone when his arms stroke out. This time, Naruto wasn't fast enough to escape. Shikamaru was so focused on his surroundings that he almost startled when his walkie-talkie made its high-pitched howling sound that signed that one of his team members was trying to contact him. He picked it up. Shikamaru? Kiba? You've reached Hinata? Yeah, she's all good. Uninjured. The target? Silence. Kiba cleared his throat. About that. He sighed. It was a shadow clone, right? Kiba choked. What? How do you know that? I'll tell you later. Hurry up and return to your posts. The boy at the other end of the line groaned. All right. We're on our way. Chapter 9 The wind was no longer mild, but chilly. The nights in the desert were cold. Shikamaru sighed as he watched the last ferry of the day depart from the port. Tiredly, he ran a hand through his hair and massaged his tense scalp. The tie tore and his hair fell around his shoulders. We're finished. There was no need to use the walkie-talkies anymore. The port was silent. Everyone, save for the five members of their team, had departed. It was in the late afternoon when Tamari finally arrived. Gara looked up from his desk when the door clicked shut and waited for her to speak up. I've got the info you requested, she said and reached a map out to him. He accepted it and spread it out on top of the neatly ordered sheets of paper he had had to work through. Even though the map showed him what he'd been dreading, he kept his face neutral. Gara didn't know how they'd done it, but they'd found out that Naruto was residing in the eastern part of the country. The posts that were positioned around that area proved that much. Naruto should just stay in wind and wait this out. No good could come out of this rash escape attempt. But Gara knew he wouldn't be able to convince him. His friend was simply too stubborn for his own good. Thank you. You should take a rest now, he advised, his words a subtle dismissal. But Tamari remained rooted to her place, her face a thoughtful frown. There's something on your mind, he remarked. She nodded. You know they're searching for someone, right? A civilian that left Kanoha, yes. Gara watched his sister nibble on her bottom lip. She was nervous. I've got a bad feeling about this, she admitted. Any particular reason? He asked, the tone giving nothing away. She shrugged. Intuition. I feel like I've seen the guy they're looking for before. He seems familiar. You'd feel the same if you'd seen his picture. Willing himself to refrain from stiffening up, he answered, maybe. He leaned back into his chair while keeping eye contact with Tamari. I will watch out for anything unusual tonight if that will ease your mind. A bright smile spread over his sister's face. Really? Gara nodded. I'll be alert the whole night through. The next time Gara entered the hotel room, all the mess from the past weeks had vanished. It had always been this way, he remembered. Naruto wasn't a particularly tidy person until the day of departure arrived. Then, everything was cleaned up until the place was void of any evidence suggesting he'd ever been there. You've got it? Naruto asked. There was something strangely eager in his voice, almost as if he was looking forward for what was to come. An odd mix of excitement and paranoia. Yes. And I also know where they've decided to position their guards. Naruto sighed heavily. Bad news? Gara chucked him the rolled-up map that Tamari had given him. You have to change your plans. They're focusing on the exact route you wanted to take. Lines spread over Naruto's face while he inspected the map. Want. I'm still taking that route. Gara shook his head, exasperated with his friend's thick-headed demeanor. This is just stupid. If you're not going to stay here, at least don't try to get caught on your way out. Naruto shrugged his concerns off and Gara was reminded of how childish his friend could be. No matter what he'd say, it'd be of no help. He was too mulish to get through. Just leave the country through its western borders. They've got no post there. Our knowledge gives us a head start. And then what? Naruto scoffed. Keep on running until they catch up with me? His face froze up, and when he reluctantly met Gara's stare again, his eyes was apologetic. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to bitch at you. It's okay. We're both a little stressed. Naruto nodded. I want to get out through the sea route to get it over and done with. Once I've reached the next port, there's no way they can trace me any further. Gara decided not to press the issue any further and reached out the plastic bag that he'd brought with him. Naruto raised his brows in surprise when he pulled out a plain beige dress. Not bad. Not bad at all, Gara. I was afraid you'd come up with something garish, but I should have known that you'd keep it subtle. Gara decided to forego discussing over his fashion choices. Instead, he sat down on a nearby chair and watched his friend pull out two pairs of shoes, a white blouse and a dark blue skirt out of the bag. Naruto skeptically pursed his lips as he inspected the last item. A little short, but it'll do. Without further ado, he created a shadow clone. Get yourself ready, he ordered. There was something seamless about how he went about all of this, as if he was all too practiced in this routine. After checking that no one on the streets was paying attention to their hotel room, Naruto opened the window and took a box in. In it lay tufts of dry platinum blonde hair. Is that a wig? Naruto nodded. Please don't tell me you've made that yourself. Because where would he get a wig from when Gara had been his only connection to the outside world for the last weeks? He couldn't have had it before that, or else he'd worn it while traveling to Suna and wouldn't have bothered shaving his head bald. Naruto's lips shifted into a lopsided grin. He beckoned the doppelganger to step closer and put the wig on. How did you do that? Gara asked, genuinely curious. I've kept my hair after I've shaved it off, and... You did what? Naruto rolled his eyes. I've kept my hair. Wasn't the first time I needed it afterwards. Then I took some nude fabric and sewed every strand on, fixed some rubber around the edges, and... He stopped his explanation when Gara met his eyes with a deadpan expression. Why didn't you just tell me to buy a wig? He shrugged. Those that are made out of real hair are hard to find. The fake ones got an artificial sheen on them and smell like plastic. Gara sighed and inspected the doppelganger. It's a different color, he noticed. Naruto nodded. That's what I put it outside for. If you lace the strands with lemon juice and let them wait in the open sun for some hours, it'll bleach the hair. You have much more knowledge on all of this than you should. Naruto tipped his head to the side. That's also what you got the coffee for. What do you mean? Gara remembered bringing over large amounts of instant coffee powder, but he didn't see how that had anything to do with the wig. Naruto grinned, grabbed his wrist and led him towards the lone desk in the room. A plastic box had been placed on it. In it lay Gara couldn't refrain from scrunching his nose up in disgust when he saw a mass of something drenched in what smelled like stale coffee. His friend pulled out the soggy mess and Gara finally realized that it was another wig. This is a really bad idea he said quietly. Offended, Naruto spluttered, it's not just an idea. I did this before and it works. Maybe you should stop spending so much time alone if you're going to come up with something like this. His friend rolled his eyes. Stop nagging. I've told you it works. If you keep the hair in the coffee for long enough, its color changes into a light brown. Plus, it dissolves my scent and cloaks everything in a smell of coffee. I could have gotten you some hair dye, you know. Naruto crossed his arms. I know what I'm doing. The smell of ammonia that's in chemical hair dye would be too suspicious. Gara sighed and sat back onto the chair. He wanted to respect his friend's experience concerning these issues, but his ideas seemed too odd to confidently rely on them. Tell me if you need my help. Naruto shrugged, took the plastic box and went to the bathroom. Gara could hear him dry the wet wig. When the boy returned to the main room, he had light brown, straight hair that reached his chin. It didn't even look half bad. Actually, it looked pretty good. The heavy smell of coffee passed by when Naruto rushed to his doppelganger to inspect the haircut it had given itself while its creator had been in the bathroom. A little uneven but it'll do, he muttered critically, ran a hand through the shoulder-long tresses and brushed the bangs out of its face. Gara lost focus over the rest of the disguise process. All he knew is that by the end of it, the original Naruto had slipped into the beige dress and flat sandals, while the doppelganger had put on the blouse and the skirt. 
The heels that it wore made its legs appear even longer in the short skirt. Somehow, he didn't make the clothes look out of place. It was probably due to Naruto having a slight built and not being extremely tall. The fact that the garments were a number or two too big helped. Did you shave your legs? You gotta commit to the role, Naruto admitted. You got the perfume? Garin nodded and pulled the bottle that he'd wrapped into plastic out of his pocket. Naruto accepted it and checked the label. Vanilla? Good choice. He took a deep breath and looked around the room as if to remember what else to do. Make up, he said. We should be almost finished then. Gara couldn't make out what he did after that. There were too many brushes, creams, and powder palettes to keep track of. But by the end, he could tell that the doppelganger had rounder, bigger-looking eyes with dolly lashes attached on them. Its nose was somehow pointier, its lips and cheeks in a matching pink. The original's eyes were almond-shaped and slant. The cheekbones were prominent, and the nose slimmer-looking than before, the lips a subtle peach. I see how you managed to escape Kanoha's grasp for so many years, Gara chuckled. You're my best friend and I wouldn't recognize you on the street. Naruto laughed. I'm good, aren't I? The laughing came to a sudden halt, and the boy reached to his chest as if he had trouble breathing. Gara stood up. Are you okay? Why, yeah, he huffed. It's just the corset. Still a bitch to get used to. Gara sighed. I'm concerned, he admitted. Naruto straightened himself up. There's nothing else I can do. He threw a thick poncho that was supposed to hide the lack of breasts towards the doppelganger. You could remain here until the dangers passed over, Gara pressed. His friend shook his head vehemently. I can't stay in this room for one day longer. There's no way I'm waiting this out like a rat they've chased into a corner. I gotta get out now. You're playing with fire, he warned. You know I've got a plan. One that might fail. Even if you send your doppelganger to cause some chaos, they'll try to find you through your scent. Naruto furrowed his brows and grabbed the map that he'd laid aside. I haven't seen Kakashi around the port, he remarked as he unwrapped it. You're on first name basis now? Gara asked, his tone unimpressed and curious at the same time. Naruto raised a brow. The guy's been chasing me through the world for ten years. If we're not on first name basis, I don't know what we are. Gara leaned back. He never struck me as such a persistent man. Do you know what his motivations are? His friend shrugged as he inspected the map. So who's the one doing the scent searching if Kakashi's looking over birds? Kiba Inazuka. He has a dog with him. H.M. He lay his head to the side. Is he, by chance, a little gullible? I don't know them that well. I wouldn't recommend getting close to anyone. But if you absolutely have to, Inazuka and the girl are your best targets. Stay away from the rest, especially from Shikamaru Nara. He may not be the physically most proficient, but he will see through your cover. I'm suspecting that he's the one who's after this whole ordeal in the first place. Naruto nodded, lost in his own thoughts. Yeah, he's the one who started this all. But even if the dog boy isn't the most intelligent member of the group, he's got the sensitive sense of smell that he'll sniff you out with. A coffee wig and some vanilla perfume aren't going to help with that. Relax, Naruto placated, I've planned ahead. He walked in front of the mirror and brushed some stray wrinkles out of his dress. You notice that I lost weight? Is this another diversionary tactic? Gara countered skeptically. No. Just the result of my new diet. Raw food. Gara sighed. I don't know what one thing has to do with the other, but continue. Body scent, Naruto explained, is partly made up through your genes, but also determined through your lifestyle. What you put into yourself, you expel in some way or the other. I've only been eating fresh, plant-based foods in the past weeks. Vegetables, fruits, nuts. The diet flushes the toxins out of your body. Your smell changes. The way Naruto explained it, it made sense, but neither of them had a particularly sensitive sense of smell to test that theory. Who knew whether this actually worked? Have you tried this out before? How do you think I've been keeping Kakashi's mutts off my tail? Gara sighed. So what's the plan? The doppelganger and I are going to go to the port. Since my scent is diminished, 
they shouldn't be able to pick up on it. But the doppelganger's wig should still smell a little like me. While the clone attracts their attention and leads them away from the port, I'm going to get on the ferry. It sounded simple. Garin knew that it was anything but. What will my role be? Naruto shook his head. You've already done enough and I'm thankful for. Since when do we thank each other, Naruto? Because they weren't like that. They didn't help each other so that the other could owe them one. They weren't best friends because of some cheap level of debt. You know that you can rely on me. Naruto's face crumpled into a grimace. I know it too well. That's what I'm afraid of, he confessed. I don't want them to know that you're helping me. Gara shook his head and pressed his lips into a thin line. The thought of just standing on the sidelines was unbearable. Any more tension between Suna and Kanoha, and this might go out of hand, Naruto reminded. But the Kazakage didn't need a reminder of the rocky political climate between the two hidden villages. At the first sign of trouble, I'll be there. Naruto felt the sun prickle on his skin. It had been way too long since he'd been out in the open. He briefly debated buying some sunglasses, but hiding his face in such an apparent way would make him look suspicious at the port. Sweat ran down his back in steady drops. He could only hope that his face wouldn't start to sweat, too, or else his makeup would be ruined. Finally, the woman he'd been waiting for passed the corner, in her arms a stack of files that she had to bring to the Kazakage. Naruto had seen her often enough to know that she was a secretary working in Gara's office. Naruto straightened himself up and passed the corner he'd been watching the streets from. A polite smile graced his face as he asked her for the way to the hospital. When she turned around to point into the appropriate direction, she didn't notice that Naruto slipped an envelope between her files. He thanked her, bid his goodbyes, and picked his stride up. His eyes met those of his doppelgangers. You done? He took out the bottle of perfume and sprayed it on his neck. Yeah. The plan worked until it didn't. Eventually, not even Naruto had a backup plan to fall back on. It was all Shikamaru Nara's fault. At the beginning, everything was going fine. Only the sea wind was working against them, blowing his doppelganger sent into the opposite direction from where the dog guy was standing. Naruto had checked up on the ninja's positions. It wasn't hard to pick up on them when their headbands were gleaming under the searing sun. Also, he could tell a fighter when he saw one. Their tense stances and searching eyes told him that they were awaiting him. His stare slipped to Shikamaru Nara. He looked just like the day he met him for the first time, a little more tired maybe. If it hadn't been for him, Naruto would probably still be mending swords at the forge in Kinzoka's smithy. We have to do something now, his doppelganger mumbled under his breath while acting interested in the cold drinks that a guy was trying to sell. We can't wait until the wind works in our favor, or we'll miss the ferry. Naruto understood the implication. Although he had counted on something like this to happen, he remained hesitant. Confronting them is a risky move. If they catch you right away, they'll blow your cover and you won't be able to buy me enough time to get on the ship. Be careful. The doppelganger brushed one hand over its skirt before it turned around to walk in the direction of the dog boy. Naruto willed himself to take deep breaths and remain calm as it closed the distance to its target. When it accidentally walked into the guy, they both fell to the ground and successfully managed to gather the other team member's attention. A flirty smile graced the clone's lips as it began to talk to the boy. Time seemed to slow down, the seconds trickling by like syrup while he waited for the glimmer of recognition to finally emerge in the guy's eyes. He startled when instead, the sound of loud barking broke through the noise and a large dog lunged after his doppelganger's ankle. It had been a close call and Naruto held his breath until the clone managed to get into safe distance. The dog and his owner went after it first. Then the guy in green, the smoker, the girl, and... His hand formed a tight fist. Why wasn't Shikamaru leaving? The boy stood unmoving, his face set into a broody frown. Then he lifted his walkie-talkie up and said something that Naruto couldn't hear from the distance. When he looked up and searched through the crowd... Naruto was careful not to turn around too quickly and raise any suspicions. To be safe, he asked the merchant to sell him a bottle of orange juice he'd been pretending to look at for a while. While passing through the crowd, he witnessed how the two men who'd left not a minute ago, returned to their original positions. 
The big dog joined them shortly later. Naruto bit back the urge to curse. They know Shikamaru Nara had caught on to his plan. He was ready to strangle that guy. There was no way he could risk going on that ship now. He was pretty confident in his disguise, but if he passed by, they'd get a much closer look at him. If he did one mistake, or Shikamaru Nara pulled another trick out of his ass, he'd be done. Especially the two older men would be impossible to escape from. He'd just seen with his own eyes how fast they were. A change of plans was in order. Either he went to a town farther away from here and waited until they left their posts, or he chose a whole different route to escape with. He mulled it over. Rivers and rain, being right next to the land of fire, was out. That left birds. But they had plenty of guards positioned up there, one of them being Kakashi. If there was one person who knew how to look through his disguise, it'd be him. He had as much experience chasing Naruto, as Naruto had fleeing from him. He uncapped the bottle and drank some juice while slowly steering away from the port. He didn't want to wait in the inner part of the country, and he couldn't escape through the nearby borders. That only left the borders that were more than a day of travel away. If they caught him on his way, it'd be the end. Not only were some of them much faster than him, but they also came in bigger numbers. Naruto could only hold them off for so long. But when had the odds ever worked in his favor before? Exactly. And he was still alive and free despite everything. Naruto would work with what he got. He always did. He looked up. The last remains of sunlight would soon vanish. He had to hurry and use the impeding darkness while he still could. At this period, it'd be easier to move without catching anyone's attention. In less than ten minutes he'd left the port and was back in the desert. His feet sank into the ground and he couldn't understand why. After all these years, he still had so much difficulty moving in this terrain. These stupid, thin strap sandals certainly weren't helping the issue. He cursed, pulled out a scroll and unsealed it. The dress, the damned corset and the sandals were discarded in favor of some simple pants, a shirt, a jacket and sturdy boots. After debating whether he should keep the wig on, he decided to take it off, too. Now that the feminine disguise was half gone, there was no meaning in keeping it on. Besides, the smell of stale coffee was starting to make him nauseous. While he was at it, he decided to get rid of the makeup, too, until he, Naruto Uzumaki, was the only one left. No doppelganger, no disguise. Mentally picturing the map he knew by heart, he debated where to go. He somehow had to reach the land of vegetables without being spotted by the guards who were looking over the nearby borders. The countries were right next to each other, so there was a considerable risk. The route he had to walk was clear in his head. Naruto had passed through so many places, he'd long become an expert on several countries' geography. However, this would have been so much easier if he'd just gotten on a ship. Now he had to trample through the sand for two days before he could even attempt to leave this land. Maybe he should pass through Suna on his way and check up on Gara to let him know that he was okay. It was a fast-moving journey. In the past, he used to get lost in this place because the area only consisted of sand and even more sand and an occasional rock if he was lucky. But he'd learn not to worry over his never-changing surroundings in order to focus on his end goal. He'd visited Gara often enough to know his way to Suna. In the course of the night, the mild wind and sparkly skies lulled him into sleepy drowsiness. The moon was only a thin sliver, barely giving any light to illuminate the void desert. There were no people, no animals, no plants, and no buildings to distract him from the mind-numbing boredom. He jumped in surprise when a loud, booming noise rang through the air and shook the ground underneath him. Naruto could feel the impact run from the sand into his body. An explosion. After remaining still for some moments, trying to understand what just happened, he gathered his thoughts. It had seemed like the blast had come from the direction of Suna. Maybe he should change his destination. If this was something that Konoha had orchestrated, it might be a trick to catch his attention and lure him into their hands. But Gara was in Suna. What if something was happening and he needed his help? Naruto wasn't a professional fighter. Most of what he knew he'd learned on the street from other street urchins. Still, he'd rather die in a fight than leave his friend to struggle on his own. At the very least, he could serve as a distraction for the enemy and buy some time. 
Just as he'd started to run again, another blast echoed through the air. But this time, Naruto kept on running confidently in the direction of Suna. The explosions kept up, one more volatile than the last as he gradually came closer to the hidden village. He twitched when he felt the ground underneath him shift. However, it wasn't the impact, but some active force moving the sand away. There was only person who could that. Gara. Suddenly, he was glad that he hadn't been able to escape today. Something was definitely going on, and his best friend was involved in it. Naruto had to help where he could. Something white flashed through the sky. He squinted. It hadn't been star, it had been far too big. Just as he was beginning to believe he'd imagined it, the big white mass emerged again and this time, Naruto managed to keep his gaze on it. It was a giant bird. Weird, he'd never seen that sort of animal in the desert before. He didn't have the chance to think about it for too long. A rush of sand rocketed from the ground and began chasing the bird through the air. Naruto searched the dunes, but Gara wasn't anywhere to be seen. Only when he lifted his head up again, did he spot his friend standing on a platform of sand in the sky, his stance even more rigid as usual. Naruto's gaze shifted back to the bird. It was hard to tell in the dark of the night, but it seemed like there was a figure sitting on the animal's back. The explosions had to be coming from them. There was a fight going on and Gara hadn't won yet. Strange. An age-old heat ignited inside him. It was the instinctual urge to jump into a fight without a care about the consequences. He'd always been impulsive, and it had gotten him into trouble many times before. Even now, at sixteen years old, he hadn't completely learned how to keep his urges under control. But no matter how much he recklessly wanted to, he could hardly reach a battlefield in the sky. He didn't have any fancy jutsu or special abilities to help him out. Everything he'd ever been talented at had been few in jutsu. He didn't understand it. Although he'd harbored dislike for all ninjas ever since he left Konoha, he had tried to learn their practices just because they were an advantage to have when you're living a life on the run. He'd stolen scrolls and even asked people who'd once went to academy for advice, but it had been of no use. He'd failed at the most simplest exercises. The only things exempt from that had been the shadow clone jutsu and fuin jutsu. While clones were incredibly helpful, he could hardly use fuin jutsu half of the time. There was too much planning, information gathering and preparing involved to use them spontaneously in combat. It simply wasn't his style and that's why he failed to grasp why he'd been such a natural at learning it. Now, too, all that knowledge was of no help. So when he watched the bird's great wings sway in a clear attempt to prepare for another attack, he did something he hadn't done in a long time, call attention to himself. Hey, bastard! The bird changed its direction until it could fix its bead-like eyes on him. It looked more like a stuffed animal than a real, living being. Yeah, you. Come down, you coward. Faint laughter filled the air. I've got no clay to waste on you, kid, shouted the man riding the bird. Naruto. Gara's serene composure was broken, his eyes widened in pure shock. The sand platform collapsed in itself and he slid it down until he stood by Naruto's side while trying to keep track of the bird that continued on swerving above them. What are you doing here? Naruto shrugged. The plan failed, he admitted. You've got caught? No. I just couldn't distract them for long enough to get on the ship. They've never even seen me. Gara relaxed slightly. What about you? What's going on here? Who's the guy on the bird? His friend focused all his attention back on his opponent. I don't know, he answered, his tone a little frustrated. I wanted to check whether you're doing okay. On my way to the port, I've encountered them. They seem to have been looking for me. Naruto continued on searching the sky. They? The other ones on the ground. You can't see him from this distance in the dark. He hasn't done anything until now but his partner has been causing me enough problems. Fortunately, I've met them before they could enter the village. At least, Suna isn't at risk of being harmed. They cautiously watched the bird decline and land on the ground to allow the man dismount it. While he slowly approached them, Naruto could distinguish another person walking next to him. Naruto, you have to go. I will hold them off in the meantime. You better not be serious, he growled. 
Anybody else wouldn't have spotted a change in Gara's demeanor, but Naruto could see the worry in his friend's eyes. I know that you don't want to leave, but there's nothing you can do. I have to concentrate on fighting them. And although Gara hadn't meant it that way, Naruto had understood him too well. At this moment, he was nothing but a burden. He was good at evading his enemies, not fighting them. Especially not against ones who could last in a fight against Gara. Still, he couldn't turn around and leave. I've got my seals. They don't help you in a battle if you didn't already have the time to prepare a specific seal for a specific opponent, Gara dismissed. Those unhelpful things almost rotted your arm off. I wouldn't underestimate them if I were you. That was pure luck. Are we honestly going to discuss that now? A thunderous boom went off right next to his ear. Naruto spitted the sand out that had protected them from another explosion. Be careful, Gara grumbled. The blonde's the one who's been causing all these explosions. He builds bombs out of clay figures. Naruto nodded and turned back to their opponents. Now that they'd come closer, he could see that the man walking next to the young, blonde boy was a short, crook-backed man. They were both cloaked in dark robes with red clouds on them. The boy lifted his hand and adjusted his eye scope that his long hair had been hiding. He laughed loud enough for them all to hear. You were right, Master Sasori. That really is the brat that Itachi and Kisame have been searching for. I can't wait to see their faces when we arrive at the hideout with two Jinchuriki in tow, yeah. Naruto knitted his brows. What are you talking about? When he looked at Gara, his friend's face was stiff and unreadable. No need to look around, yeah? I was referring to you, QB brat. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Has one of those explosions messed up a few screws in your head? The boy sent his hunchbacked partner a nasty glare when the man let out an almost silent chuckle and said I like him. The boy scoffed. I'm going to deal with the fox on my own. Keep the Kazakage off my back, Master Sasori. His partner had barely grunted when an explosion went off right beside Gara and Naruto. Before they had a chance to recover, another chain of explosions followed. Gara's sand was the only barrier that shielded them from the impact. Without resting itself back to the ground, it rushed after the boy who jumped on his bird's back again. Naruto huffed. This guy wanted an explosion. He could have one. He grabbed a scroll from the inside of his jacket and unsealed the stored knives that he'd forged himself while he'd been working in the smithy. When the bird descended, he took aim and stroke out. A brief sense of satisfaction filled him as a chain of boisterous, cracking sounds rang through his ears and the sky was filled with fire and smoke. It vanished when the bird emerged out of the fumes, its owner on its back. The cloak was dirted, the hair in disarray, but otherwise, the boy seemed to be doing fine. A grin was plastered on his face as he said, All right, that was a sneaky trick. I didn't expect any seals to be engraved into the steel. I can always respect a person who likes a nice explosion. He laughed and jumped off the bird's back. The knives that had just been aimed at his direction were held between his fingers. Not so shoddy, yeah? Maybe I'll keep them, for times like these when I'm low on clay. You do that, Naruto quipped and let the knives explode again. The seals would work until an explosion would crack the engravings. But when the smoke cleared, there was only a mass of clay to be seen. A doppelganger. He felt the skin on the back of his hand tingle. His breath hitched when he spotted a white spider climbing up his arm. Another explosion went off and this time, Naruto wasn't able to escape it. Although he'd shaken the spider off, he hadn't managed to get himself into safe distance. He used the initial few seconds after the explosion to get out of the smoke cloud. He needed a clear field of vision. As he coughed, the numbness that had allowed him to move so quickly died down and introduced the pain of burned and shredded flesh to him. He checked himself, just to be sure, and was relieved to confirm that all limbs were still at their place. The arm the spider had been crawling on was bleeding though. The skin coating it had been blazed off, leaving only the pink, vulnerable flesh behind. It was gross but Naruto was used to seeing his injuries. He stood up and shifted his weight onto his left leg and gasped silently. It might be sprained. When he lifted his hand to check why the hell his scalp was burning so badly, he realized that almost half of his hair had been hinged off. Naruto! 
He felt Gara's gourd press against his back. I'm all right, he answered without bothering to turn around. He had to focus on his battle. You're injured, his friend persisted. Nothing I haven't experienced before. A surge of wind blew through the desert, cleared the last remains of smoke, and revealed the boy who had caused this whole mess. You've got quick reflexes, yeah? Naruto tensely watched him put his hands into the bag that was strapped around his waist. I gotta ask, though why don't you just use the power of the bijou? Your friend's doing it too. Naruto scoffed. You honestly think I'm a jinchuriki? The boy knitted his brows and turned towards his partner who wait. Who was that guy? The old, hunchbacked man was gone. In his place stood a young, red-haired boy in the same cloak. The man from before was a puppet, Gara mumbled. This is the actual him. Hey, Master Sasori. You sure that's him, right? I've told you, Daydara. Don't make me repeat myself. Blue eyes met each other again. You heard it, yeah? It's not your job to discuss with them, said his partner, his voice managing to sound venomous although it was oddly monotone. I don't want to be late, so hurry up. Daydara rolled his eyes. We'll be returning with two jinchuriki, he'll understand. Besides, this is entertaining. Confusedly, Naruto interjected, You think I wouldn't notice if there was a chakra monster living inside of me? I'm not a jinchuriki. The smirk didn't slip from Daidara's lips. You sure? Hey, how about you ask your friend? He looks a little paler than usual, HM? Naruto spared Gara a short glance. To his surprise, his friend really did seem a little uneasy. What is he talking about, Gara? I'm not entirely sure, he answered lowly. What do you mean, entirely? Naruto questioned. He shook his head. This was ridiculous. But why was Gara acting so strangely? This is not the right time to argue. Yeah, I agree. The right time would have been right after you'd found something out. You did find something out, right? The notion has crossed my mind, his friend admitted. You have got to be kidding me. This is a joke, right? Like I said, I didn't know anything for sure, Gara answered, his voice unusually meek. Shikaka's told me, but you know that he's a rotten liar. It was absurd. Of course, it was false. Shikaku had helped to push Gara to the brink of insanity with his lies. They'd be stupid to trust a word, he says. None of these allegations made sense. Didn't they? Naruto remembered Kanoha. People whispering behind his back with hate and fear-filled eyes. The similarities between his and Gara's past. The present. Kanoha's refusal to let go of him. Bullshit. If there was a bijou residing inside of him, there would be a seal maintaining the cage. He would have noticed if there had been a seal on him. Naruto may not be exceptionally talented, but he knew his way around Fuinjutsu. Daidara laughed loudly and even Sasori's marble face expressed amusement. This is comedy gold. Before Naruto could question his friend any further, a puppet came to life and shot forward. But before it could reach either of them, the sand swallowed it up and tore it apart. Daidara snickered. The Kasakage's making your dolls look pretty old, Master Sasori. I'd suggest an explosion. You're talking although all you've managed to do is give that clueless weakling a new haircut? Daidara scoffed and put both hands into his bag. Whatever. Let's finish this, yeah? Naruto produced five doppelgangers, flipped out two short, thin-bladed tantos, one hand holding each, and focused on his opponent. He didn't only use weapons to attach seals on. After all, he liked these tantos, they were handy and, with a little practice, felt more like an extension of himself than anything else. Nonetheless, they'd be of no use if he didn't come close to his opponent. Daidara could evade his explosives, but his own clay explosives were much more difficult to escape from since they could actually move on their own regard. If he wanted to win this, he had to be quick and catch him off guard. Daidara stretched his arms out his palms facing flat forwards. With grotesque fascination, Naruto watched tongues slither out of the mouths inside his hands. The mouths opened wide and spurted clay out. At first, Naruto thought that Daidara had messed something up because the white mass only lied limply on the ground. But soon, the clay built itself up until it formed a vaguely humanoid figure. 
Let me show you what art is. The figure wobbled forwards, but Naruto sidestepped it and sliced it with his tantos horizontally where an actual human being's gut would have been. The clay parted into two separate masses and splattered onto the ground. It didn't remain there, though. Just after a few seconds, it rebuilt itself, this time into two figures, and attacked him again, only to be held off by his doppelgangers. Again, the clay parted, formed itself up, and multiplied his opponents. If this guy wanted to fight with numbers, Naruto could recuperate. A few hundred doppelgangers appeared with a single hand seal. Daidara smirked. One of the clay figures went off, caused a mid sized explosion, and took half of his doppelgangers with it. The guy was playing with him. And Naruto wasn't making much progress. If he wanted to end this fight, he had to take care of the source of the problem and destroy those freaky mouths. He spared a short glance to Gara, who was still busy fighting the redhead coordinating a puppet. No, he had to develop a plan without involving his friend in it. Something quick and foolproof to get rid of those arms. He chuckled. All right. He surged forward with five other doppelgangers, evaded the clay figures, not even bothering to get involved in a fight with them. There was only one target. They gradually closed distance when another boisterous explosion shook the sand underneath his feet off and threw him up into the air. He might have lost consciousness for a few seconds, he wasn't sure. When he opened his eyes, he was lying on his back, his vision a little blurry. He wiggled his toes, twitched with his fingers. Good, everything was where it belonged. The bastard must have hit a bomb underneath the ground. He groaned as he watched Daidara approach with light steps. The feet halted next to his head and when he looked up, the boy wore a playful smile on his lips. He lifted his foot and pressed it against Naruto's head, shifting some of his weight onto his skull. Naruto could feel the blood-clotted sand grind against his raw skin. You finally done? Daidara mocked. You're lucky I'm not here to kill you or this would have been over long ago. Naruto coughed, watched the blood splatter from his mouth against the shoe sole, and drip back onto his face. He tried to speak, but he couldn't gather enough air in his lungs to do even that. It took him a few attempts until he managed to croak, You needed me alive? He chuckled. Well, that backfired. Hurriedly, the foot was lifted off his forehead. For a second, he came close to blacking out. But when his vision cleared, he saw Daidara crouch down with a worried expression on his face. Shit! Don't die on me yet, you little brat. I'll be in one hell of a trouble if you kick the bucket, yeah. Two fingers were pressed against his neck, checking his pulse. The sleeve slid up, revealing the skinny wrist underneath. With one flick of his arm, Naruto grabbed it and activated the seal. He barely had the chance to turn around and pull his arm away before the explosion went off. Smoke filled the air. Naruto could smell its bitter tint mixed with the foul stench of burning flesh. Was it his flesh? He couldn't tell. His body was oddly numb. He had to get out of here. When he opened his eyes to gather his surroundings, they burned so much that they teared up. He forced them to remain open but there was only gray smoke enveloping him and clouding his vision. The ringing in his ears robbed him of all sense of direction he might have had. He pressed himself against the ground. His sense of touch was all he had left. While he forced himself to turn on his stomach and stem himself up, the pangs gradually returned. Gripping the hot sand with his hands, he compelled himself to crawl forward. Although he couldn't have progressed for more than a few feet, fatigue soon made him collapse. He coughed, and the metallic taste on the back of his throat told him that he was still hacking blood out. Gritting his teeth, he stretched his arms out, buried his fingers in the sand and pulled himself forward, his chest and stomach dragging against the heated ground. Eventually, the numbness dissipated entirely and made room for an all-consuming wave of pain that multiplied with every passing second. It was torture, and if Naruto hadn't had the experience from accidentally blowing himself up while practicing his seals before, he might have gone crazy. Suddenly, blissfully cool hands grabbed his wrists and pulled him out of the fumes. Never had oxygen been so delicious before. When he could finally use his eyes again, he saw Gara concernedly checking his injuries. Naruto followed his gaze. His clothes were destroyed almost completely and gave access to the burned, bleeding flesh underneath. His right ankle and wrist looked misshapen, 
probably broken. His back felt as if had been flayed. I'll live. We have to get medical attention, Gara said lowly. Naruto could see the pure fear in his eyes. I'm okay. No, you aren't. Naruto ignored him. Is the puppeteer finished? Aside from looking distraught, his friend didn't seem to be in a bad shape. Yes, he's dead. What happened? Naruto wanted to shrug but he could only flinch when he tried to move his shoulders. Clavicle was probably broken too. We have to get rid of those mouths in his palms. I wanted to fix an explosion tag and blow his arm off, but I couldn't get close. Gara stiffened up. Naruto. He took a deep breath. What did you do? He played dead and blew himself up along with me. Slowly, the smoke dissipated into the night air, leaving Daidara standing in the ditch that the impact had dug. With squeamish satisfaction, Naruto watched blood trickle down from the stump where once his hand had been. Daidara laughed. You've got an understanding for the fine arts, Fox. I'd like to have met you under different circumstances. He smiled. Don't worry. After we're done with you, I will honor your last moments with an explosion. It's a pity you won't be able to watch yourself implode, but it will be beautiful, I promise. I will make you into a piece of art. Enough, Gara grinded out and with a start, the sand shot up and attempted to swallow Daidara up. The clay bird that had been waiting patiently for its master's command flew by and caught Daidara who jumped up to evade the sand. Only the undamaged arm was caught in Gara's attack and squashed up until the blood painted the sand red. Naruto breathed a sigh of relief. Unless he pulls another trick out of his ass, we should be good. That doesn't seem too unlikely, Gara commented cautiously. They watched the bird fly high only to turn around and steer towards them. What is he doing? Naruto worried. Gara didn't answer and used the sand to build up a thick protection wall between them and the bird. There was silence. Naruto noticed that they couldn't even hear the bird's wings slap against the wind anymore. It was eerie, especially after the series of noisy explosions that had just occurred. Gara's looked as uneasy as Naruto was feeling. The hair on the back of his neck stood up. A shiver ran down his spine. An innate instinct told him that something was about to happen. He didn't even catch white spiders digging their way through the sand. The last thing he saw was Gara shoving him backwards, away from the wall. Then, there was darkness. When he woke up, he was in a sewer. That's it for part 4. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.